All right, open your Bibles to Esther, to chapter 8. One of the heroes of the book here, Mordecai, is going to get a makeover complete with accessories. The last time we saw him, he was wearing sackcloth covered with ashes. In chapter 8, he's made over and goes out from the presence of the king in royal apparel of blue and white with a great crown of gold and a garment of fine linen and purple. The most important accessory of Mordecai's new wardrobe was the king's signet ring. It was the official seal of Persia. Once pressed into wax or ink, it was the seal and the signature of the king, uh, and it validated uh, whatever decree it was on. Now, Mordecai's makeover was not just a fashion statement, therefore. His robes introduced him as the king's ambassador, and the ring endowed him with the king's authority. If you look closely at Mordecai with those uh, characteristics in mind, you're kind of looking at yourself in a spiritual sense, and that's what we're going to uh, portray tonight. You have a signet, or it might be more accurate to say you've been signeted. When a person becomes a Christian, the Bible says they are sealed with the Holy Spirit. That's in Ephesians 1.13. It says you are sealed for the day of redemption, Ephesians 4.30. God gives every believer his signet by the Holy Spirit indwelling us. And in Ephesians, uh, there's a passage that speaks of the Holy Spirit as a, uh, an engagement guarantee. Uh, and so in a very real sense, we have the king's signet. And we are all the king's ambassadors. An ambassador is one who represents his or her country. As a citizen of heaven, we're ambassadors. While on the earth, we represent heaven uh, to others who are not yet citizens. And we have the king's authority. You can declare with absolute authority the gospel of Jesus Christ, calling upon men and women and children to either be saved or to perish for all eternity and promising them the forgiveness of sins. Do you ever stop and think what an incredible thing it is for you to I know we don't do it nonchalantly, we take it seriously, but almost nonchalantly declare that if you receive Jesus Christ, your sins will be forgiven, past, present, and future, and all guilt will be removed from you, and you will be justified. It'll be just as if you never sinned. That's, that's the greatest news in the world. It's a powerful statement, yet you and I believe in our hearts because of what's happened to us as Christians that we can declare that with absolute authority because Jesus isn't just a way. He is the way, the truth, and the life, uh, and we have that authority. <clears throat> Previously in Esther, Persian Prime Minister Haman hated Mordecai because he refused to bow down before him. Haman convinced the king, King Ahasuerus, or your Bible might say Xerxes, to issue a decree allowing Persians to annihilate any and all Jews throughout the empire on a particular date. Little did Haman know that Mordecai was the uncle of Queen Esther and that the queen was a Jew. She revealed her true identity to the king and pleaded for her people. It resulted in Haman being taken away, and he was executed on the gallows upon which he had intended to execute Mordecai. And, and so we saw this last week. We talked a lot about God's providence and the timing of God's providence. <clears throat> this decree to annihilate the Jews on a certain day was still in effect, and it could not be revoked. The Jewish population of the Persian Empire was still in serious danger. And so there's this crazy thing in Persia where once the king decreed something, it couldn't be revoked. Uh, and so they, they had to counter it some other way. So we're going to see how they do that. So verse 1 says, On that day King Ahasuerus... I was thinking about this today, by the way. Um, just from the point of it, people say, well, what Bible do you teach from or what do you recommend? And normally I recommend the New King James. I'm going to start recommending any Bible that has Xerxes because it's a lot easier to type when you're doing your message. Do you know, I still... I have, I have such a hard time spelling Ahasuerus. And... Uh, don't come up to me after and tell me I can copy and paste. I, I'm aware of that, but anyway. So anyway, King Ahasuerus gave... I, I like Nebuchadnezzar. I finally... I can spell that all night, you know. Uh, but Ahasuerus just... It, there's something wrong with it. Anyway, he gave Queen Esther the house of Haman, the enemy of the Jews, 
And Mordecai came before the king, and Esther had told him uh, how he was related to her. So the king took off his signet ring, which he had taken from Haman, and gave it to Mordecai, and Esther appointed Mordecai over the house of Haman. One thought here, you'd think by now that Ahasuerus would be a little more discriminating about who he gave his signet ring to. With it, a person yielded tremendous authority, uh, and he had given it to Haman kind of on a whim. Now he just gives it to Mordecai. Um, they, you know, come on, I'm not, he doesn't need to pray about it because he's not a Christian, but think this through. Now, it's a good thing he gives it to Mordecai. I'm not against that, but um, he's just not good with authority. Now, I mentioned that the signet is used in the New Testament as a metaphor of God giving you His Holy Spirit. Look around, and I don't mean literally to look around. Take a peek in a few minutes. Christians are an odd bunch. I mean, there's some odd-looking people here, <laughs> including me. I mean, let's face it. I mean, you, you think, Gene's kind of an odd-looking guy. What's he doing growing a beard at this age? You know, it's all gray. Does he know his beard is gray? You know, those kinds of things. And so um, you'd think God would be a little more discriminating about who he saves. But he's not because he's no respecter of persons. He saves any and all who will believe on Jesus Christ. He's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to eternal life. And that's a, a great thing about our God. Verse 3, Now Esther spoke again to the king, fell down at his feet, and implored him with tears, to counteract the evil of Haman, the Agagite, and the scheme which he had devised against the Jews. And the king held out the golden scepter towards Esther. So Esther arose and stood before the king and said, If it pleases the king, and if I have found favor in his sight, and the thing seems right to the king, and I am pleasing in his eyes, let it be written to revoke the letters devised by Haman, the son of Hamadatha, the Agagite, which he wrote to annihilate the Jews who are in all the king's provinces. For how can I endure to see the evil that will come to my people, or how can I endure to see the destruction of my countrymen? Esther implored the king with tears on behalf of her doomed countrymen. So should we if we are to be effective in sharing the gospel. We should implore God with tears on behalf of our doomed countrymen, which it would include the entire human race. When we implore God with tears, we're not getting Him to be more compassionate. It just obviously, we're not asking God to have more compassion on sinners. He wants to save sinners. You can't have any more compassion than God. You, if, you, if you want to see the compassion of God the Father, you see it in Jesus Christ weeping over Jerusalem. He said, I would have saved you. I would have protected you, but you would not. And so compassion is not something God lacks. We don't have to storm heaven to get Him to act compassionately. Um, God so loved the world. Jesus wept over Jerusalem. God takes no pleasure in the death of the wicked. When we implore God with tears, it's really to get our hearts aligned with God's heart about sharing the Lord with others, uh, even those who we normally probably don't uh, hang out with or think about um, because God is no respecter of persons. And so we, we want to implore God. We want to pray specifically about opportunities to share the gospel and how to do it and when to do it and the power to do it because it is the power of God unto salvation. Uh, and, and so we're not, we're not trying to get God to act. He's, he's excited about acting. Uh, we're getting, he's getting us excited about it, actually. So verse 7, Then King Ahasuerus said to Queen Esther and Mordecai the Jew, Indeed, I've given Esther the house of Haman, and they have hanged him on the gallows because he tried to lay his hand on the Jews. You yourselves write a decree concerning the Jews as you please in the king's name and seal it with the king's signet ring. For whatever is written in the king's name and sealed with the king's signet ring, no one can revoke. Uh, so as I said, the signed decree of a Persian king could not be revoked. It could only be countered by another decree. And so this is actually kind of a, um, it's not really shrewd on Xerxes' part because this, this was standard procedure. It's like, well, I said this, and I, we can't counteract that. That's law now, but um, maybe you could think of another. And so that's how they did things in Persia. They kept piling things on that kind of were contrary to each other. 
Uh, which is so funny to me because you're wielding this tremendous authority in your signet ring and then somebody, well, how about you sign, okay, I'll sign that too. And they're going to, in effect, you know, cancel each other out. But what's interesting here is you think about it for a few minutes. There were two decrees affecting the Jews. One would issue in death. The other would issue in life. And that's because we live in a world in which there are two decrees. A decree of death hangs over all the human race because all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, and the wages of sin is death. And so there is a decree of death. People are born dead in trespasses and sins, and if they don't come to know Christ as their Savior and they die in their sins, they will die the second death and be lost forever. If you're here tonight, you're not a believer in Jesus Christ. Uh, you know, we say you only live once. Well, you're going to die twice. You're going to die physically, and then you're going to die forever spiritually. Uh, be, and the Bible calls it the second death. It's the great white throne judgment of God where uh, the Lord uh, reveals the way of salvation was free and gracious, but you rejected it, and so there's no address for you in heaven, uh, and so you go to where uh, the devil and his angels uh, are, are going to end up. And so uh, salvation, it's a serious thing, this decree of death that hangs over the human race. A second degree has been issued that can save any of the people who are headed for destruction. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whosoever believes in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. And so that's the second decree. And so... Uh, God could not simply ignore the decree of death He gave Adam and Eve. I don't want to say He's limited the way a, a Persian king was, but because of the nature of the situation, God couldn't just say, yeah, I was just kidding about that whole sin thing. Uh, let's, let's have a do-over. I told you not to eat of any of the trees and you ate of the tree. Let's try that again tomorrow. Uh, it, it didn't work that way because he said in the day you eat of it, in the moment you eat of it, you will surely die. And we know that Adam and Eve, they, they didn't physically die. They began to die physically. They did die spiritually, and they would have died eternally and headed for the second death had God not intervened. So he couldn't simply ignore the decree of death. He told them that... Uh, what was going to happen, and it, it could not be undecreed or undone in that manner. But God acted immediately to counter the decree of death with a second decree uh, by sending Jesus to take our place in death. And that is a decree of life, of eternal life to whosoever believes in Him. Uh, and and uh, that's a, a powerful analogy. And so verse 9, so the king's scribes, uh, were called at that time in the third month, which is the month of Savan, on the 23rd day, and it was written according to all that Mordecai commanded to the Jews, the satraps, the governors, and the princes of the provinces from India to Ethiopia, 127 provinces in all, to every province in its own script, <clears throat> to every people in their own language, and to the Jews in their own script and language. And he wrote in the name of King Ahasuerus, sealed it with the king's signet ring, and sent letters by couriers on horseback, riding on royal horses bred from swift steeds. I wonder if he did anything else with the king's signet ring. You know, like canceled his debts or signed up for videos or, you know, like cable and stuff. You know, hey, I, probably not, but anyway. And so here we see, this is also interesting. It's a great just symbolic chapter. And by symbolic, not that it didn't really happen, but it's a, I should say, typological more than symbolic. There's a lot of types here. And so words were written in every language and tongue in order to save the Jews. And then messengers spread that good news throughout all the land. Well, what does that sound like to you? Well, it sounds like what we do today as Christians in the Great Commission. God has given His Word, the Bible, He's preserved it, sometimes miraculously. I mean, I don't need to tell you that people have tried to uh, destroy the Word of God, to actually physically destroy it so that it doesn't exist anymore, but God has miraculously preserved it. It is constantly being translated into other languages and tongues so that people can hear the good news of Jesus Christ in their own language. And just think... Have you ever thought about how universal the Bible is? 
how that it can be translated into all these different languages, and how its message can reach an Eastern mind, a Western mind, uh, you know, uh, a, an intellectual mind, uh, a, a, a mind that's not so intellectual. You know, I don't want to put anybody down, but, um, but do you understand what I mean? I mean, I mean it's, it's a universal message. And, and um, you know, a lot of times people say, oh, we don't understand the Bible in the West because it was written to an Eastern audience. And, and you know, I think we struggle sometimes with context because we, we read the Bible as if it were happening in New York City instead of the Middle East. But we can easily overcome that by just being intelligent and, and applying context. But, you know, it, it is... God wrote the Bible for everyone, everywhere, and it, it can be understood once it's put in their language. And then He sends out messengers with it to tell other people. And so that's essentially what happened in the kingdom of Persia uh, during that time. And you know, it's interesting to me. I mean, these are this is Persia. I mean, first there was Babylon, right, and King Nebuchadnezzar. And there's a chapter in in, in Daniel where Nebuchadnezzar gets saved. Uh, it's the chapter where he thinks, you know, he's built this great kingdom. He's out walking on the walls, and just as the words are coming out of his mouth, he gets struck with this uh, weird illness where he's out in the fields growing hair and eating grass and stuff. And, and, um, and then at the end of that, God uh, brings his mind back to him, and he gets saved, and he writes a tract. The, the chapter is a tract that he wrote and sent to the entire kingdom of Babylon about his conversion to the one true God, the God of Israel. Now we're seeing uh, not, not exactly that, but we're, you know, we're seeing something, how, how something can affect an entire kingdom. Maybe it, it gives us hope. Doesn't it give you hope that something could actually happen in the United States in a spiritual way? I mean, don't you sometimes, be honest, don't you sometimes think we're just too far gone for there to be a sweeping spiritual revival where somebody would get up in one, and I haven't watched any of the debates, but where somebody would get up in one of the debates and just really preach the gospel and talk about Jesus Christ. Not just let on that they're a Christian, and maybe somebody's done this, you can correct me afterwards, but I mean just really, you know, th that, that people would get genuinely saved and, and that it would affect our entire nation. Um, I, I think maybe, maybe it's just me, but I think of Babylon sometimes as maybe the size of Armona you know. <clears throat> but, I mean, this was a world-dominating empire, so was the Persian Empire, and, and these guys made these sweeping decrees about God, the God of the Bible, and, and, and let everybody know what was happening. And so, uh, let that give us hope. Verse 11, by these letters, the king permitted the Jews who were in every city to gather together and protect their lives, to destroy, to kill, and annihilate all the forces of any people or province that would assault them, both little children and women, and to plunder their possessions. <clears throat> on one day in all the provinces of King Ahasuerus, on the 13th day of the 12th month, which is the month of Adar. Now, the practical advice in these letters was for the Jews to gather together and protect their lives. Though they were few, they would be stronger gathered together. And that's still good advice. Believers ought to gather together as often as they can. God promised to be present in our gatherings. He can and He will speak to us as we worship Him and read and teach His Word. Uh, and so, you know, it doesn't mean we get together every day, but we should, each of us should have a regular plan of gathering with other Christians uh, because it's at those gatherings that God meets with us in a special way and that we get strengthened. It's great advice. And so in Persia, the Jews gathered together on a particular day because it was on that day they were in danger of attack, and that's when they were going to fight back. What day of the week are you in spiritual danger? Well, every day. Every day that ends with a Y, you're in spiritual danger. Somebody said that the other day. I, what was it? I forget. It was some joke. They said, I only do that on every day that ends with a Y, and that would be every day. Uh, should you gather together every day? Well, in a way, we should, 
while we don't have meetings every day as a fellowship, you can gather a little bit every day, either with God in your devotions or throughout the day <clears throat> as you read or hear God's Word or as you enjoy the fellowship of other believers. And uh, now, I think you know this about me. I'm not really uh, tech savvy. I mean, I don't know why my iPad works. Some people, that's, some people when they say, oh, you're real techie, no, I don't know why my iPad works, and, and I don't even know how to use most of its functions, but I like it. I like my little clicker that I have now to advance the pages. So I like all that stuff. So what I'm going to say next is, I like social media. I'm, I'm the anomaly, I guess, to the person who, because every other post, you know, on, uh, is get off social media, take a fast from social media. Why don't people talk to each other anymore? This isn't real life. And, and it, it sounds spiritual, and I know people can get overboard with it. Maybe I'm overboard. Maybe you need to rebuke me. But you know what's interesting about it? You can encourage people all day on social media. You can share from your heart. You can share scripture. You can share situations. You can be godly. You can be joyous. People can read. They can get excited about what you're doing because you're doing it as unto the Lord. I don't, I don't see a problem with it. What's the problem? Uh, you know, I mean, yeah, it, you, can you do it too much? Sure. Can you do it to the exclusion of spending time with your kids? Sure. But you were already doing that with video games. And, and so at least this way you're helping minister to people. You know, so, but, you know, so uh, individually people need to look at their own internet usage and media usage, but it's a great tool for just ministering to people. And I'm telling you, Paul the Apostle would be on Twitter. He'd be tweeting, got stoned today, raised from the dead, PTL. I think Paul the Apostle, if, if, if the saints in heaven see what's happening on the earth, I'm not convinced that they do. I don't know why they'd want to. Uh, but if they do, I think Paul is going crazy thinking, why didn't I have a smartphone? I could have, I could have GPSed myself. I could have gotten more places and reached more people with a smartphone. I mean, I'm sure, you know, he would have figured all that out. So anyway... So, in a sense, we can be connected. We're not gathering together, but we're connected with each other. And just remember, let's be uplifting. Let's be encouraging. Let's share Scripture. You know, a lot of your non-Christian friends and, and friend, non-Christian friends of your friends who see these posts, um, they see what's happening, uh, uh, and they, they get the Word of God. That's their only dose of the Word of God. So let's get into it. Let's use it for God's glory. Verse 13, uh, a copy of the document was to be issued as a decree in every province and published for all people so that the Jews would be ready on that day to avenge themselves on their enemies. The couriers who rode on royal horses went out, hastened and pressed on by the king's command, and the decree was issued in Shushan in the citadel. The decree originated in the capital and then was spread to every province. It's like coming to church. You hear about God. You hear about his decrees, or we would say his commands, about his compassions. And then you leave here, and you're to take that with you, what you've heard and learned, to your province. In biblical terms, we say you're being equipped to do the work of the ministry. And so you have a province where you live, and I don't live there, and I don't work there. And, and you know, we all live and work in our own little province, so either with other Christians or uh, non-Christians, uh, you know, sometimes a mix of them both, and, and, and we're to take what we've learned and, and to apply the decrees out there. Verse 15, so Mordecai went out from the presence of the king in royal apparel of blue and white with a great crown of gold and a garment of fine linen and purple, and the city of Shushan rejoiced and was glad. And so Mordecai kind of looked like the king. You're to look like your king. To be a Christian is to be like Christ. You're to be changed day by day and moment by moment into the image of Jesus. You are His representation to the world. You know, it's become popular, and I'm not against it, uh, for Christians to be called Christ followers. Have you, have you encountered that in literature, especially among hipster Christians and younger Christians? They want to be Christ followers. And that's okay because we, we, of course, we're following Christ. Take our cross and follow Him. Very biblical. 
But I still like the word Christian because it means Christ-like. And, and I want to, I mean, I can, Peter followed Jesus too from a distance. And he had some problems with some things at the crucifixion. Uh, and so we can follow Christ, but we want to do it as Christians in a Christ-like way. We want people to look at our lives and, and, and see Jesus reflected in our lives, not just hear about us following Jesus, but to actually see the Lord. Um, so what should you portray as an ambassador? Well, four things are mentioned now in verse 16. The Jews have light and gladness, joy and honor. Aren't those great things? Light, gladness, joy, and honor. Light, and the word here can mean prosperity. It is a sense of spiritual prosperity of your resources in the Lord. Depending upon your spiritual resources instead of fretting about the lack of earthly resources, it is knowing and showing that God's grace is always enough for you. And we've all been in situations like that where we need light, where we need prosperity, and the only prosperity is spiritual. We just don't have the physical resources that we would like to have, and so we have to wait upon the Lord. Gladness describes a festival. Life should be a celebration. We talked about this at length on Sunday, how we should portray the Christian life as a feast, and even if we fast, we should enjoy it. Whether you're abounding and feel like celebrating or whether you're abased and don't feel like celebrating, you should celebrate the Christian life. After all, you're signeted, sealed, and delivered and on your way to heaven. And then it mentions joy. Here it means cheerfulness and the accompanying rejoicing. You should raise the mood in your circumstances, not drag everyone farther down in them. And then honor. This word is sometimes translated worship, sometimes triumph. The idea is that you can always worship because you know that you will triumph in the Lord. My all-time favorite guys, I think, in the whole Bible outside of Jesus are Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And when they're talking to Nebuchadnezzar, I, I, and, and he says, I'm going to throw you in the fire. I'm going to burn you guys. You are going to regret this. And they said, well, hey, do what you're going to do because God's going to deliver us or he's not going to deliver us, but either way, we ain't going to bow down. I, I love their attitude. It's like God's going to deliver us. If he doesn't, who cares? And then, of course, God did. He was walking with them in the furnace. Um, and so we will triumph in the Lord. Verse 17, and in every province and city, wherever the king's command and decree came, the Jews had joy and gladness, a feast and a holiday. And then many of the people of the land became Jews because fear of the Jews fell upon them. So see, it's, it was evangelistic. The word went out and they converted to Judaism because there was something about these people. Their gatherings were inviting and celebratory. When we gather to be equipped for the work of the ministry, it should be with joy and with gladness. It should seem as if we're at a feast celebrating a holiday. Notice the Persians had the fear of Jews upon them. Their gatherings may have been joyous and seemed like a holiday, but the Persians understood something deeply serious and sincere was taking place at the same time. We should look at our methods to be sure that they are biblical but also contemporary. The key, though, seems to be us. We need to be genuine and exude light and gladness and joy and honor, and then we will have meetings that are like a spiritual feast and a holiday, and others will look on that and want to join in with us, regardless our style or our particular way of presenting things. Uh, it, there's a, if there's a genuineness about a person, that's what you're drawn to. Now, I remember when Alan Redpath was still alive and uh, we went to a, a, a pastor's conference that he shared at. You couldn't be any more formal than Alan Redpath. He always sang a brief hymn before he would teach a Bible study. And, uh, I mean, he was very liturgical. He followed a certain order. Uh, but he was amazing to listen to in terms of his insight and the depth. You felt like he had just come out of the Holy of Holies having talked to God about what he wanted to tell you. And it was just, it was amazing. It was wonderful. And, and so, you know, it, it, you, you, it didn't depend on the worship that was before it or the kind of worship. I'm not saying those things aren't important or that we don't want to do them. But ultimately, people are drawn to God because of other people and the genuineness of that relationship. Uh, 
the Persians had that fear, but they saw the Jews were also joyous, and they joined them. Think of it like this. It was not really advisable to convert to being a Jew in Persia. After all, there was still coming a day of attack upon which Jews might have to defend themselves. And <clears throat> just because they had a decree to defend themselves didn't mean Persians couldn't rise up against them. But Persians converted anyway, knowing the consequences. There are many stories of Christian martyrs who those who were leading them to martyrdom laid down their weapons and joined them and became martyrs with them. And, and I mean, that's powerful when you, you see something, there's something so real about these people that they're willing to die for it that I'm going to die for it too, if that's what it calls for. There's just something amazing about it. And so we're to spend time with the king pleading for people, and then we emerge looking like and acting like Christians. Amen. Amen.